and all and OB and all the little crazy things that go. You can you can laugh if you want to. I like those old movies, but one of the things I noticed in those old movies is boy, they started us women out back in the 15, 1600s about foundation. You know those things called corsets. And they would take that corset around and they would pull that corset. And they, they, what were they trying to do? Make it look like everybody's got a waist size 19. Uh -huh. And they would start real young and they would, they would form and they would shape their foundation. And if you, if you have a wise mother or a wise grandmother, they'll tell you, look, you've got to start with a foundation. Uh, now, women today, they don't know nothing about those. Young women today, they don't know nothing about foundation. See, there's all kinds of mess underneath. There's all kinds of problems. There's all kinds of things that without a proper foundation, you're going to have bulges and things sliding out and things hanging out and all the lumps and all the, okay, you got me now, a foundation. See, we only talk about a foundation like this cement floor. But as people, we need a foundation. We need a foundation. I'll guarantee you that, that the things that you hide under your makeup, the things you hide under your clothing, the things you hide under your shoes aren't always so pretty. But it takes a foundation to cover up and to get rid of the, the appearance of what you think is real. So truth is like that. Truth is a foundation. So I'm going to lay a foundation so that you can receive the revelation that God has for you this morning. Are you ready? You, did you bring your Bible to the house of God? It would be important that you read the book. It would be important that you put that word in front of your eyes. Amen? Because it's life to those that find it. Amen? So I want to go over here to um, some scriptures to lay a foundation that's going to cover all those doubts, all that stinking thinking, all that lack of unbelief, because if it's in the word, I can believe it. Well, at least one person believes that. Amen. If it's in the word, I can believe it. Amen. If it's in the word, it's for me. Amen. Everything that's in this Bible is for all people. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for the word. Amen. Amen. So if it's in the word, it's going to cover up all that stinking thinking. It's going to conceal all those lies, keep you, protect you from all those lies of the enemy, those things you thought about. Amen? So turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians, first of all. I'm going to go through three scriptures before I get to the, the, the meat of this message this morning. But the message title, if I had to call it something, this is the force is in you. The force is in you. Amen? Ephesians chapter 2, are you there? All right. I was going to read that. I'm going to get my other Bible. So I was going to read that one out of King James. I think it says it a little clearer. Look, some of you, you just got to get an app on your phone so you can get the word with you everywhere you go. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. So Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to begin and we're going to read verse 1 to start with. Wait just a minute. Because I want to read this out of King James. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 2. And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, where in time past you walked according to the course or the pattern of this world, or that we can say it this way, the kingdom of this world, this world system. Did you know that you are not of this world? All right. You used to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince. Doesn't say a king. Hello. The prince. Satan is not a king. Get that in your thinking. This is foundation. Satan is not a king. He will never be a king. There is one king. And when he tried to take over the king's throne... He didn't lose his position as a prince. Nope. He's just a fallen one. But he will never be king. Ooh, glory to God. According to the prince 
of the power of the air, the spirit, say spirit. spirit. The word spirit means force. The force that now works in the children of disobedience. I go down to verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, Brother Bradwell started with it this morning, his love endures forever. And that next verse where he went down and said he took us out of captivity. That's what the whole word of God is about this morning. Who God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, has quickened us together has made us lie alive together. He connected us to life. He has quickened us together with Christ. Christ is the head and we are the body. There is no other head. Not one of us in the body of Christ will ever be called the head. Just like Jesus or just like Satan will never be called the king, we will never be called the head. There is one head. Anything with two heads is a monster. There's one head of the church. Everybody after that head is under that head. Everything flows down from the head. There is one head and Christ is the head, the Bible says, of the body. So he's in charge. He's in charge. That the head is who's in charge. Ooh, glory to God. Help us, Jesus. I gotta keep moving, or I'm gonna get in something else. All right. He's quickened us together with Christ. He's raised us together and uh, up together, and he made us to sit together. Can you say that? He made me. To sit together with Christ. All right, so it says he's made us to sit together in where? Heavenly places. Heavenly places. We can, tra we can translate the word heavenly into kingdom places. Kingdom positions. Jesus said, I am going away, and if I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, he didn't say where I will be. He was talking about where he was going. But he said the place that I am, in my oneness with the Father, in my dominion with the Father, in my connection with the Father, the life-giving spirit to all human life. I am going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Ain't talking about a mansion in heaven. It's talking about a place and a position of dominion, power, and authority that what is in heaven shall reign also in the earth in the people of God. Oh, I'm trying to help you this morning. Heavenly places. Now go with me over to Colossians. I'm going to read this out of the uh, NIV. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You'll find Colossians a couple books at later. Amen. You got to learn your Bible. Colossians chapter 1. And I'll read this out of the NIV. It says, verse 10. Colossians 1, 10 through 13. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. Bearing fruit... In every good work. The fruit that we are to bear is not when we get to heaven. The fruit that we are to bear is while we are here. Amen. Amen. He said we will bear good fruit. Look at how we get there in the good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. We got to know our position. We got to know who we are. When we grow in the knowledge of God, we find out, oh, we are. Jesus said, hmm. In Philippians chapter 2, that God, that we are to have the mind of Christ. That Christ did not think it robbery to be counted equal with God. Living in a place of dominion, power, and authority. All right, Jesus. 
I'm going too, too deep yet. Okay, let's start. All right. So look at verse 10 again. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power. How much power? All power. All power. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So that you may have what do we need? What do we need this power for? What do we need this might for? So that you might have what? Great endurance, patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father. Oh, I love this part. Who has qualified you? Who has enabled you? It's not in my ability. It's not by works of righteousness that I have done, but it's according to his mercy. He saved me. He set me in a position of authority and power and dominion, dignity, identity, and purpose. And I am here for a reason. I am here to restore and reconcile man back unto God. I am here to share that Christ has been seated. He has already been seated and he has prepared a place and you are seated together with him. And there is a divine nature available to you. There is a force in you. Hallelujah. So he's qualified you to share the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued you. Woo! He has rescued you. I don't know about you, Brother Gene, but I needed some rescuing. I needed to be rescued. And while I was yet a sinner, he loved me enough to say, let me figure this out. I'm going to give with my own arms salvation. I'm going to rescue you. What did he rescue you from? The dominion of darkness. Who's rescued you. Say, I've been rescued. Any man that's in Christ has been rescued. We've been rescued from Satan has no power over you. You have been rescued from the dominion of darkness. I don't know if you ever saw that movie years ago called The Guardian, and this guy would go and he'd rescue people out of the ocean. And they would drop him down in some of the most treacherous areas. Do you know Jesus was dropped down from heaven into the most treacherous place so that he could rescue you and I? Now, if he came to rescue you, why would you stay in the ocean and keep drowning and quit talking death and unbelief and doubt when the Bible says that he has rescued you from the dominion of darkness and he has delivered you from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of his dear son? Oh, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm shouting happy today. He said, in whom we have redemption. Oh, I wish I could get on the subject of redemption. But it means you've been completely made whole. You've been completely made whole. Saved, rescued, delivered. Amen? Ransomed. Bought back. He has rescued you from the dominion of darkness. And he has brought us in. Who? Now, wait a minute. Now, if, if um, say the company Boeing. Boeing's an airplane company, if you don't know that. The company Boeing comes to you and says to you, I want to offer you a job. Say, okay. How much does it pay? Well, it starts out at $20 hour. Oh, that sounds really good. And you start working for the company, and you start uh, uh, showing what you got. And they come to you and they say, you know what, instead of you being just a part of this company, we'd like to make you a partner. We'd like to make you an owner. We'd like to make you an heir with us, that everything that comes into Boeing, you get a part of it. Jesus said, we are not slaves, we are not servants, we are sons. We are heirs. We are partners together with God. We are partners. Everything the Father has belongs to us. She said, all you got to do is speak it in my name. See, that, that, that tells I'm, I'm with, you, if you go in, I'm with Boeing. I'm one of the partners of Boeing. Would anybody question your authority and power? 
That's what we need to do as the saints of God. I'm with Jesus. We're partners. Everything that he has belongs to me. Everything that he has belongs to me. And he makes sure of it. He spilled precious blood that paid for everything. Hallelujah. He gave us power. Oh, I got to hurry. I can't get into that message. All right. So it says that he has rescued you and I. Now look at verse, uh, oh, I better not go there. We better go to 2 Corinthians or I'll get into something else too deep. 2 Corinthians. Oh, hallelujah. A gully washer, Jesus. I want you to understand something here today. You've been made an heir. You've been made a partner. You've been given authority and dominion. You've been rescued from the dominion of darkness. It no longer has power over you. Hallelujah. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. You have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We have been made free. Everything they say about today, talk about our freedom. We've been made free. You got that? That's part of your foundation. That's something you've got to understand to understand the word of God. You have been made free. You're a joint heir. You're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. You are not a beggar. You are not unworthy. You are not a sinner. You are redeemed. You have been paid for. Get in your position. Get in your position. Second Corinthians chapter 3. And let's look at verse 3 and 4, 3, 4, and 5, first of all. Second Corinthians 3, 3. You show that you are a letter from Christ as a result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit. With the Spirit of the living God. We can say it this way. You have our result of the ministry written not with ink, but with the force of the living God. With the force of the living God. On, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours. Ooh. Anybody got some confidence this morning? Amen. It's going to make sense to you in a minute. I'm just giving you the foundation to cover up all those lies, all that deception, all that fear, and all that shame, and all that guilt. The Bible says right here in 2 Corinthians 3, 4, such confidence is ours through Christ Jesus. Not that we are confident in ourselves. You want to know why we don't live in our position? Because we have believed the lie, I got this. Self-absorbed society. It's mine. And I'm going to do what I want with it. This life that you have was breathed in you by the living force of God. It is in him you live. In him you move. And in him you have your being. And when God chooses to take you out, he's going to take that breath from you. Your life is not your own. It never belonged to you and I. Our life is not our own. Paul said, yeah, I am hidden with Christ. It is hidden. It is covered. It is clothed with Christ. Life has been restored to me. Life is not your own. It's a lie. You can't do whatever you want, whenever you want. It's a lie. But the good thing is, is if I walk in him, ooh, I have glory, I have power, I have dominion, I have joy, I have peace, I have long suffering, I have patience. I have fortitude, I have eternity in my heart. Hallelujah. Oh, help me, Jesus. Verse 5. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves. My car, my house, they're my kids. Nope. 
Everything you have came from the hand of Almighty God and His power to work on your behalf, to give you a job, to give you money, to give you a place to store that money, to go and have good uh, be, well, to be able to go get whatever you need. And when you didn't have anything, you put something in your hand so that you had what you needed because you're always having all sufficiency and all things abounding to every good work. As you are in God, nothing you have is yours. Oh, what am I going to do with my money? You don't have any. You only have money because God saw fit to give you money. And you believed in principles and promises that caused that money to be multiplied to you. So you might have more money. But you ain't got any money unless God gives you money. Did you know you don't have your children? You don't have children. They're not your children. You couldn't have children Unless the divine creative force of God took a seed and an egg and caused it to have life, you would not have had children. The Bible says children are a heritage from the Lord. That word heritage, I love it. When I studied out this one, I changed out my talking to my kids when they were teenagers. I, I, I learned that they were not mine, they were God's. The Bible says children are a heritage from the Lord. You know what that word heritage means? Tenants from God. You got a house, a place to provide. God says, let me give a few tenants to them to care for, to shelter, to help, to God. But there comes a day the tenants got to move out. They might be 20, they might be 25, they might be 45. Kick the tenant out. <laughs> 45, let me help you. Amen. Amen. Children are not ours. They've been entrusted to us to teach them and train them in the ways of the Lord. Amen. And when we have trained them and they become mature, the Bible says they will not depart from the truth that they were set in our life to receive. Amen. They're not my children. They're his children. That he entrusted me to raise. And it trusted me to train. And it trusted me to equip to be able to live in and maneuver into a world system that they are not a part of. Hallelujah. Not my house. Not my car. Not my children. Not my money. Nothing I have is mine. That's what the Bible says. Ooh, help us, Lord. I know somebody really got, got to do some repenting on that. <laughs> All right, let me finish this part. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, a new position, a new promise, a new force that entered the earth to deliver mankind. It says here, not of a letter, and that word letter means law, not of the letter, mm -hmm. but it's of the spirit. For the letter or the law kills, but the spirit gives life. I said the spirit gives life. Now you're probably thinking, what on earth and where is she taking us? Now the scripture the Lord gave me, before I started looking at the foundation of that scripture, so I could understand it, was 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. I'm sure you know that verse. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. Go ahead and turn there. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Hmm. 2 Timothy 1 7. For God, King, right? Lord, has not given us a spirit of timidity, fear, cowardice. That's what that word means. God has not given us a spirit of fear. 
God has not given us a spirit of timidity. God has not given us a spirit of cowardice. But he has given unto us, but he has given unto us a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And they go, whoo, hallelujah. Okay, so I'm not supposed to live in fear. I'm supposed to live in power, love, and a sound mind. But it's deeper than that. There's a gully washer underneath of there. God has not given us a force. That word force. God has not given us a spirit. So I said, okay, Lord, if you didn't give us a spirit of fear, but you gave us a spirit, and you call it three things, power, love, and a sound mind, I need to know more about what you, I know all about what you didn't give me. I've lived more and more of my life in fear than I've lived in in faith. Is that just me? I know all about fear and what it does and what it produces. I understand this force of fear that has and breeds doubt and unbelief and sickness and disease and lies and deception and shame and guilt and poverty. I know all about this spirit called fear. But I need to understand what you meant when you said you've given me a, but you haven't given me a spirit of fear. You give me a spirit of power. You give me a spirit of love and of a sound, a spirit of a sound mind. So before I can understand what he's given me, I gotta understand that word spirit. You've given me a spirit. See, God is a spirit. And we are made in the image and likeness of God, and we are a spirit. And we have or possess a mind, will, and emotions. And we live in a house called a body. But most Christians even, because of the lack of the knowledge of God, let their body be in charge. I don't feel good today, so I'm not doing what I intended to do. So my spirit, what my spirit was leading me to do, I can't do because my body is Lord of my life today. And so I cannot do what I should do. I'm, not, I'm feeling some kind of way today, mind, will, and emotions. Mind is in control. And, and, and because this person hurt me, because this person did this to me, I'm not going to show this kind of respect to them or this kind of love to them. So what's in control? Your, your, not, your spirit's not in control, control. Your mind is in control. But God said that he raised you up in your spirit. He made you alive in your spirit. And when your spirit became alive, see, when you were in the pattern of this world, your spirit was dead. But when you came to Christ, he made your spirit alive and said, this is the boss, your spirit. You are to live a life led by the spirit of the living God. The force is in you. In fact, he told us that when we were made alive, he came to live on the inside of us with the spirit of life. And the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from my mind, my will, and my emotions. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from what my body has to say about it. Hallelujah. But we live our Christian lives out of order. Why is there so much deception? Why is there so much problem and heartache in the body of Christ? Why are people begging God? Because they are not living in their spirit being life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and behold, all things become new. Put on the new man. In the spirit of your mind, be renewed by the washing of the water of the word of God. How do I get my mind and my body to follow after my spirit? The word. The word. 
It is the word that sets my body free. It is the word that sets my mind free. It is actually the word that puts my body and my spirit and my mind and my emotions and my will under my control. Ah, thank you. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, thank you. I don't think I can do this. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What just happened to your emotions, your mind, and your body? It's going where God said yeah. you're supposed to go. Oh, yeah. It's doing what God said you're supposed to do. Well, I just can't do that. So you're living in your emotional realm, in your I can'ts. Because the word of God that sets my mind free from its control over me says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, I got to get into the meat of this. So he's not giving us that, that word spirit is a force. Now, the spirit of fear is called a vital spirit. Now, I don't know, you see, the devil, he tries to contort, he tries to twist things, he tries to bring deception. See, he knows truth. He was with God. He knows who God is. And he knows that we are as spirits, never slumber or sleep. You dream, don't you? Your, your spirit is eternally alive forever. It will never slumber or sleep because God who is a spirit caused your spirit was made in his image and his likeness and your spirit never sleeps. Your body is still subject to decay until the last day when death is defeated and decay is defeated and it will become immortal. But in the time being, your mind and your body rest, but your spirit never sleeps. So Satan creates this thing called Pokemon. Did you hear me? Satan creates this thing or makes this thing called Pokemon. And Pokemon, I don't, I don't play Pokemon because I don't live in that kingdom. I don't play Pokemon because I am not of that kingdom. Pokemon in this, in this, I didn't study it all out, but, but when I studied out this vital spirit, Pokemon is called a vital spirit mm -hmm. that never slumbers or sleeps. Mm -hmm. Driving people into something. Driving people into darkness. He distorts the truth. So we think it's a new fad, it's a new thing, let me go play some Pokemon. It's just for fun. Just like Harry Potter, just for fun. Mm -hmm. Why would you entertain the kingdom of darkness and all the lies of the enemy that make him say he look like a king and he ain't a king? See, we wonder why there's fear and there's shame and there's defeat in our life, but we don't. We are still conforming ourselves after the pattern of this world, even though we are not of this world. I'm trying to help somebody. Somebody needs to go home and throw their Pokemon away. Hallelujah. But this vital spirit, are you still with me? Yeah. Okay. It prevents sleep. It's a force that, that is called a causative factor. Now, when you really study the word of God, and you find this, we're just talking about one verse now. God has not given you a spirit of fear, a force that has a vital ability to, to cause you never to, to rest. See, doesn't that what worry does? Then what anxiety does, it causes you to never rest. But there has been laid up a rest that remaineth for the saints of God. God wants you to enter into the rest, and he said you can't enter there with disobedience. You can't enter there with unbelief. So if you want to cause, be in the place of rest, you're going to have to say no to the causative force. A causative force. Let me tell you what that is. A causative factor is a fear that hinders development. It hinders e uh, evolving into all that he wants me to be. Like that song said today. I give everything to be all that you want me to be. I give everything. There's a causative force called sin 
There's a cause and effect that causes sin that causes you not, keeps you down. Amen? That's where racism comes from. That's where inequality comes from, from the from sin. Because Acts chapter 17, verse, or Acts chapter 23, verse 17, or 26, 17, anyways, right in there. It says that from one seed, all nations came. We were created people of color as one race. We are one, but sin separated us into classes, into races, into genders. Sin did that. Adam was called one being, male, female. And then Adam and Eve were separated, and Eve was not called Eve until after the fall. Study your Bible. They were called Adam. They were one. They were equal. All people are equal if we understand who God is. It is sin that separates. It is sin that causes others to feel less than. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Oh, we've been seated right beside the king of kings. A force. While we're here in this world, he didn't give us a spirit of fear. Or a cause, there was a causative factor that hindered our, our evolving into what God had intended us to be. There was a causative factor that caused sickness and disease and, and uh, defilement and rage and anger and shame and guilt. There was a causative factor. And so God had to change that causative factor with the holy blood of God that by that blood, by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. By the blood of Jesus, I have been forgiven of all my sins. By the blood of Jesus and the kingship of Jesus, taken down off the cross before sundown, poverty cannot come upon me. The curse of poverty does not rest upon the people of God. It's a lie. Amen. But in order to understand that, I've got to take care of the cause and effect. Fear. It's a vital spirit that drives people away from where God intended them to be. Drives people from full development in who they are in Christ. So he said, so in or the, the causative factor or the thing that's going to come against this fear is power and love and a sound mind. Now let me share these with you. Are, are you still with me? Can you give me about 15 more minutes? Can you take it? All right. Now, what is this power about? He's given us a spirit or a force. Now, that force is a creative factor. Oh, glory to God. But he has given unto us a creative factor that is one element that is the foundation that balances a person. See, Christ brought balance back. He brought what God had intended to be spirit, soul, body. Amen. He brought it back by coming in likeness of a human man. God incarnate means God was clothed in flesh. The force was hidden in a human body. And when that force was taken down to hell, that spirit was taken up because the body didn't go there. Jesus' body was in the tomb. That spirit went down to the lower parts of hell illegally. He wasn't supposed to be there. He was a secret agent from heaven. And he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly and split hell wide open and took the keys of the kingdom of hell death and the grave and he ascended picked up his body it became immortal glorified but it didn't get glorified when he came on the earth didn't he tell mary don't touch me didn't he tell this up don't touch me i haven't yet ascended where god is i gotta take this holy blood and i gotta get there and when i get there I'm going to be glorified. 
My body right now is subject to your death. So you see me. I got up out of the grave. I'm alive. But don't handle me and don't touch me because I've not what? Gone into the heavenly tabernacle and presented your blood. My blood for you. And so when I do that, then you'll know because I'm going to send that power right back down in the form of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to send that power right back down. And I'm going to give to you the power that I have. You, the works that I do, you shall do also because I am going to the Father. And if I go to the Father, he will send the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. To give you power. To deposit, when you come to Christ, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. I'll give you the love. And I'll give you the soundness of mind. Your mind will have to be renewed by the word, the washing of the water of the word. But your whole being, spirit, soul, and body will be made alive. Hallelujah. So let me just share these three, these three things. A force that is creative, that breathes life, motivates, drives, and energizes. You know what we call that as Christians? Zeal. Man, that person's got fire. Man, that person's got zeal. Man, that person is strong. When we say a person is strong, it means no matter what comes their way, they seem to keep standing. They keep, keep their joy. They keep their peace. That no matter what the enemy tries to bring them down, for some reason they just stand. And they just stay strong. That's the power of the Spirit working on the inside of them. The same Spirit of power that's in them is in you. But you don't have a clue it's in you. You've not turned on the switch of power and lived in fellowship with Almighty God in that connective link that Christ brought to you through salvation that you will be one with the Father even as He and the Father are one. Jesus said, we shall be one. We're going to be one just like the Father is one. Hallelujah. So God did not give me a, 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 a force of fear, of cowardice, or timidity. He gave me the force of power. The force of power, I was thinking about some of the things, and like I said, it's a gully washer because I don't have time to, to look at all of it. But he said that he gave us power over all the works of the enemy. He gave us authority and power in his name over all the works of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm us. He said, I'll give you power to lay hands on the sick. I'll give you power to drive out demons. I'll give you power to go into unreached places of the world. No uh, evil thing shall befall you. No snake, no dirty water, nothing will come against you from sharing the truth of the gospel. You'll live and not die. Hallelujah. You're safe because there's a force in you. I've given you the power Okay, now what else did he give us power? I gave you power to obtain wealth. Wealth belongs to you and I. I already shared that about the king at the cross. Wealth belongs to us. I said, poverty mentality, you're going to have to die to it. I am always having all sufficiency in all things, abounding to every good work. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I am blessed in my going in. I am blessed in my coming out. Everything I put my hand to is blessed. I am blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed in the marketplace. I'm blessed in the home front. I'm blessed. So I have power to obtain wealth. I have a force working on my behalf that all men will give unto me if I will enact the force. Amen. How do I do it? Give. And it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give back unto you. Favor. He gave you power to obtain favor with kings. He said to bring you through the kings of the city. He said the kings of the city will serve you. Power to obtain favor. 
with all men, even your enemies. You have power to cause your enemies to be at peace with you. There is a force available to you as a believer. You've not been given a spirit of cowardice. You've been given a spirit of power, a miraculous supernatural might. God. So why are we walking around like this? I want to bless the Lord. I really want to get someone. Will you please pray for me? I don't have money to pay my rent. Give, and it shall be given unto you. You can never outgive. So we have anything to give? You got some food in your cupboard? You got a car that you can drive to take somebody to work? You got a washing machine you can wash somebody's clothes that doesn't have a washer? Give. Give. Give doesn't have a definition except give. Give. Give an ear to listen. Give a heart, a hug. Some of you uh, people that are in here that are married and have relationships, some of these single people, you're the only hug they get all week long, but yet you withhold your affection. Like it's yours. Amen. Give, and it shall be given unto you. He who shows himself friendly has many friends. But you sit around like a bump on a log and you don't talk to anybody. You just wait for somebody to say something to you. And bless God, I'm not going back to that church because nobody said hello to me. Show yourself, friend. Oh, I want to jump off that. Okay. Hallelujah. So he gives us power. Power over the enemy. Power to obtain wealth. Power to walk in peace. Power to walk in joy. Power to walk in strength. And be in moved in a, immovable in our inner man. Strength in the Lord and in the power of his might. Number two, he gives us the spirit of the force of love. Agape. The God kind of love. Love is kind. Love is not rude. It's not vainglorious. It doesn't want its own way. It doesn't make a record of right or wrong. Love never, fa never fails. Love is self-control. Love doesn't envy. It's not jealous. It's not proud. The agape God kind of love is patient. It's kind. It's long-suffering. It's goodness. It's meekness. It's temperance. It shows goodwill to all people. Love is not a respecter of persons. So there is a force at work. If you will live in the force, if you will allow the love of God to envelop you, you will have power over your enemies. You have power over the enemy of fear. You have power over the enemy of depression and oppression. You have, have, will have power over the, over the bondage of addiction. You will have power over rejection, over abandonment. The power, the force is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him shall not be condemned by what? Shall be saved. Love. What kind of love is this that God would lay down his life for us? He said perfect love drives out fear. Love is the bond of perfectness. Perfection. Oneness with God. It comes from love. What you want love walk look like? How's your love walk? Is the force working through you and in you? It's in there. Love is an available force to you as a believer. A kind answer turns away wrath. Love suffers long. Love is in you. Hallelujah. He commanded us to love one another. In 1 Corinthians 13, he said, follow the way of love. Will you just turn to one scripture for that? I, I need two more minutes. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your word. Is this helping you this morning? He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Colossians chapter 3. I want to stop. I want to share this real quick about love, and I'll move on to the last one, the soundness of mind. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's holy chosen people, 
holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself. Who puts the clothes on? Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other forgiveness and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love that binds them all together in perfect unity. You want to live in victory and be a conqueror in Jesus seated in heavenly places? You've got to let the force that's in you be at work. Amen. Amen. You've been given power. You've been given love. And now the last one, you've been given a sound mind. Now that sound mind is from two Greek words, sozo and perono, which means sophrono. Put them together and they make one word, soundness of mind. Picturing a mind that has been delivered, rescued, revived, salvaged, and protected is now safe and secure. Romans 8 tells us that the mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind by the life of the Spirit, a mind controlled by the Spirit, what Spirit? Your resurrected Spirit. The mind controlled by the spirit being first in charge will be life and peace. The mind controlled by the spirit will be or produce life and peace. So this mind controlled by the spirit, that word spirit, remember, is dunamis power. A, dy a dynamite force to blow out absurd thoughts, doubt, shame, to blow away, to, to dynamo, to dynamite away unworthiness, shame, guilt. So if our mind is tempted and we are succumbed to fear, God's word and his spirit working in us will deliver us will rescue our mind, will salvage us, and will cause us to have logical thinking. What's logical? Logical is, what are the facts? Logic is that place where we know that what the word says is so. It's truth. This is logical. What the president's saying right now is not logical. What the world out there and all the entertainers in the world are saying, it's not logical. What they say about the economy, not logical. The logic's right here. The truth is right here. Amen? That I don't have anything to fear because God is my sovereign Lord and King. He is the one who is in charge of the universe. He's in charge of this world system. They think they're in charge. You ever had someone who thought they were in charge? I remember when my son was 14, he thought he was in charge. I showed him real quick who was in charge. <laughs> Amen? God, in a moment, is going to show everybody. He said, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. Though we do not know what we shall be, we shall be like him. Hallelujah. Death will be conquered forever. And we shall rule and reign as kings and priests unto our God. No princes. In God's kingdom, he didn't call us princes. He called us kings and priests. Hallelujah. So when you allow the word of God the force of power, of love, and soundness of mind, you will think differently. You will live in your right standing with God. You will live in your position. You will live in prosperity. You won't live in fear and shame and guilt, unforgiveness, stubbornness, 
and bow it in, you'll be in humility. You see, stubbornness and pride come from a lack of humility, but it's in you. The force is in you. The power, the love. I don't think I can love that person. Well, then you don't know Christ. Because if you know Christ, love is in you. Well, you don't understand. You don't know what they did. It's under the blood. The cross is level at the foot of the cross. He'll come exclusively. Thank you, Jesus. There's power. The Spirit of the Lord is great and mighty. In the name of Jesus, we have obtained mercy through love that endures. It'll never be changed. He said he would never relent, never regret that he called us his own. When we mess up, he was here. Have some mercy. I still love you. Do you have that kind of mercy for your fellow man? That when they wrong you, when they did something that they shouldn't have done, can you still look them in the face and love them no matter what? Because see, my love, my love is conditional. But the force that's in me, the love that's in me, in my spirit being, if I'm living as a spirit man, is unconditional. And it's a powerful force to bring reconciliation to families, to bring healing to the body. The body of Christ needs a lot of healing. A lot of people won't walk in the doors of church today because people who had the force in them didn't use that force and push them out. And we, with the compassion of God, have to go out and repent on the behalf of someone else and bring them back. Amen? There is a force to be reckoned with. That force is fear and torment and death and sin. But it has already been reckoned with by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He already delivered all who will believe. Maybe you're here this morning and you live in that fear. You can't rest. There's a, a you, you have that vital spirit working against you every day. You, you, you worry, you're, you're afraid, you're in shame and in guilt and separation from God. But the Bible says if you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. If you'll just say, I don't want to live under this force anymore. I want to live under the force of power and of love and a sound mind that Jesus gave, that Jesus paid for me. The Bible says that today, what day is it? Today. Well, today is the day of salvation. The day that you can be rescued and delivered from the dominion of darkness and translated into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of his dear son. You see, going to church does not make you saved. Any more than sitting at McDonald's makes you a Big Mac or sitting in your garage makes you a car. You cannot sit in church and become a Christian. You have to come by the door, by the way. There's only one way. If any man come to me, he must come by Jesus Christ. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. Now, if you really took hold of what I was preaching this morning, and about the belly washer, just those words, he's the way, he's the truth, and the life are connected to that scripture. He's the way. He's the way of escape. He's the truth. He's the foundation of all things. And his truth will remain forever. There's somebody in this room that you heard the truth. It's like a little mustard seed. Years ago, you went to Sunday school. Maybe you rode the bus to church. Maybe you went to the house of God. But that seed is in you. The Bible says it is incorruptible. You can't get rid of it. Oh my goodness. When Jesus entered the earth, when the word became flesh, and it was called that God would make salvation for everyone who will believe, it can never be taken away. And that word that's on the inside of you, it can never be destroyed. It will produce fruit if you water it with the washing of the water of the word. And that fruit is salvation, wholeness, healing, dominion, prosperity. It all is done at Calvary.
grief. And what was done at the cross is for everyone. Let's just stand to our feet and honor Jesus. Honor him for what he gave to us. That song of what you gave to me, Lord, that song you all were singing earlier today. But when I think about what you gave to me, I don't know the words of it, but the verse of that last, I think it was that last song.